Hi, Prane. Thanks so much for joining me. <laughs> hey, thanks. Thanks for uh, having me here. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to learn about uh, your story. Uh, let's let's kick it off. Uh, would you like to share some information about your background and how Signos got started? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm developer background, worked on development for like a couple of years. Uh, and then I was doing product management at Microsoft. And uh, while I was, and like that was earlier, and then after that, I started doing leading product at a company here in India. And that's where we got uh, to know about the space of observability of like, basically we had uh, lots of engineers in our team and we didn't have good observability systems in place. And whenever there used to be any issue, uh, we would sort of get into a war room mode to figure out like, hey, wh where things are going wrong? Is this service fine? Is that service fine? And that sort of sort of whole experience was pretty, uh, like not so great, right? And at that time we were using, I think Prometheus and Elastic, and still it was like not easy to tie together different things and like Elastic was, will go down often and things like that, right? And we would not even, uh, so yeah, so we started Signos primarily with the aim that, hey, like, can we have a product which does all the uh, three things like metrics, traces, and logs, these are the three signals for observability and try to give this in a, uh, like a single pane of glass sort of view. And yeah, uh, like that's where was, I was coming from and my co-founder, he was, uh, an engineering manager at his company, and he was seeing issues with microservices. So with coming off uh, things like Kubernetes, you start having multiple microservices rather than having a single monolith. And in that case, if something goes wrong in a microservice down the line, you have to figure out, like figuring out like what's the root cause of that problem is not so easy because some issue might have been happening in the underneath services. And then you have to figure out like what's happening. Like the, the effect of that would come like a bit later, like a couple of services upstream. So, so you are seeing that and I was seeing issues like, hey, this this experience is so not so great. So like we thought like, hey, can we do something in this space? And uh, both of us being uh, developers by background, we thought like, let's do something in open source because we knew there are like players so like SaaS players, like data dog, you know, like but it didn't come very naturally to us to like go to a place and sign up as some account manager will come in and things like that. So we thought there should be a product which does this like, uh, which is much better uh, from a developer experience perspective. So, so yeah, that's, <laughs> that has been our sharing. Absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for sharing your background. And uh, the decision to open source signals as well as your own needs for observability and open telemetry. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit, what it has looked like. Uh, and, and the first contributors maybe that, that were involved. So what did that all look like early on? Yeah, so I think uh, we started with, like we never thought that hey, like, this will be closed source. We thought that let's do it in open source uh, because as I mentioned, right, we think that the developer experience there's much better. You get a support from the community. We just wanted to do open source first. And I don't know, like we started, I think we started trying to do the stuff we wanted with Grafana. I think Grafana is sort of the existing tools which people use, like pro, you can do Prometheus and visualize in Grafana, but we're not able to sort of get the same experience what we wanted to see, for example, in tools like, uh, like other SaaS tools, right? And that's why we thought that, hey, like, let's build the whole visualization layer, the whole backend in open source by ourselves. That's, so that's where we started. Uh, so we are part of my Combinator, uh, which is an accelerator based on FUS. And I think our first sort of big uh, launch was mm -hmm. launch in Hacker News, where we shared for the first time with uh, about the project with the world. and. Like it was overwhelming. Like we got lots of interest, but lots of us like very critical and like very like, hey, why are you choosing this data store and why are you choosing this data store? And and that was good also as in, in the sense that we got to learn a lot more aspects of the product which we had to think about. Uh, but it was very interesting. Like I think we got like some 
200 awards or something so it was like trending on the front page for some time uh and that sort of shows us that hey like there's like more people who are interested in a product like this and there's sort of interest in the community that hey something should exist uh because like when you're starting a project right you are like okay like is this just two of us who are interested in this or are there more people who might find this interesting right so so yeah, i think that gave us some confidence that okay let's there's some leg to this let's let's work more on this and we started pushing out code um i think to your question on first contributor i think it came very organically there's like nothing specifically doing i think what we were just doing was to uh, share about the project in different forums seek feedback like wherever developers are hanging out and from there some 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 people started trying signals out just testing it in their local dev environment at hail what does it look like and i use it in for my project and then uh, one day we found that hey like somebody has raised a pr and uh, at the, till that time it was like just few of us like internally internal team were trying to collaborate and said uh, like raise pr to the projects and suddenly find that hey like, like there's somebody new is not part of that team i think that okay uh, like somebody can actually con like find something which is wrong with the uh, with the current code base and then sort of contribute back and yeah like that was amazing for us i think i think it was somewhere in in some front end part of our code base that's yeah i always love hearing about the the very the very beginning and since then actually curious to ask how many times have you launched be it on hacker news or product hunt or this or there um if you could count them like you know <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, we did two launches. Like after that, we did one more launch. Like when we had some more, uh, like substantial improvements in the product, we did a product hunt launch. Uh, but yeah, like we have not done like not thinking about it. We have not done sort of big launches as mm -hmm. such. Though we like often share like whenever we do a release and then there are, like some improvements in the release, we share with the uh, like different dev communities out there. And it's always great to get feedback from that perspective. Um, and like being open source, we also get lots of feedback in terms of, hey, like can you do something like this instead of like this? So which is very interesting. So mm -hmm. yeah. and a continual process. Uh, and yeah. you, you guys are probably dog fooding a lot using your own product uh, with with your own community. I don't know. Could you touch briefly about that? Uh, if 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 that's the case, so we're gonna do. Yeah, so uh, just to give you background, like Signals is uh, an application monitoring product. Whenever you are running some uh, stack on your cloud, for example, you are running a Java service that's like a web app which is running, and then you want to understand, hey, like how is this Java Java app performing? Are my customers seeing it fast, slow? Is it fast, slow? Is it giving errors, right? So we help developers monitor their applications and. If there are any troubles, we can they can send proactive alerts and um, get like more steps on how they can debug it, right? And yeah, so we use signals internally in terms of like monitoring our own stack in our own applications. For example, if you have deployed our demo environment in in a, in a machine, right? If that machine is increasing high CPU uses, uh, or like if that is showing high latencies, which is like a request which you are making is taking a long time to return back. Uh, so those are the type of things we monitor, and then that sends alerts to our Slack channel, right? So we have like we internally we use Slack for uh, monitoring our product, and like that's the main way sort of where we use Signals currently. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And uh, the, I mean the 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 breadth of people I'm sure is is big in terms of you know it could be the the indie developer all the way to a big enterprise using Signals. So how have you navigated uh, potentially focusing your conversations and then for your roadmap and backlog as well? Uh, and how does that relate to monetization? Uh, if you could tell people about Silly, yeah. Yeah, so Signals as a product, like primarily we're slightly different from like more developer focused products because the value of the product is primarily when teams are using it as in mm -hmm. when you are real, because you monitor your production services with a tool like ours. Like if you are just trying some code out 
in your like laptop and things like that, you don't really need uh, application monitoring and observability tool. All right. So uh, our user base teams use cases. It may be small teams, like three people team, four people team, but they are they have something which they have in production, which is live to the world, and then only you care about that. Hey, is that service slow? Are people seeing errors? And that's where like observability or application monitoring starts becoming important. So we are a bit uh, like different from like more developer focused sort of open source projects. And primarily like it starts maybe from like four or five people team and this mm -hmm. where they put their product out in the world and to like huge enterprise uh, where they have like 10,000 people and then they want to monitor the stack. They want to get complete visibility. So there's a huge sort of swath there and we get a request from like all sorts of use cases, but sort of how do we think about our roadmap is that we have a view on where the product should be, what are the key areas we want to focus on as a product and, and we sort of tie together the issues with the community, community raises or the issues which they're facing with sort of that uh, view. And that okay. Uh, for example, one of the use cases that we want to closely tie different type of telemetry signals. So there are metrics, there's traces, logs, right? What we think today is that products today can do a much better job in like integrating these together and then being able to surface like insights from that. And we as an open source project, like we have a unique advantage where we have a single data store where we store all the three different type of signals. So the correlation becomes much more like powerful there. And that sort of is one direction we are focusing on in terms of uh, the product where the product is heading, right? And then we have, um, so one other area is like deployment modes, right? So what we have seen is like people, want to deploy it more actively like in Kubernetes and Helms. So you're seeing lots of adoptions there because if you deploy in Kubernetes and Helm, like using Helm charts, you can auto instrument your services. So you don't need to go to each service and then start sort of adding your libraries and start sending data to us, right? So we try to enable that path much faster. So the core, like one of the key focus for us is how can we help developers get started very fast, right? Uh, like the whole point about developer experience. And we think that that's one of the great advantage of being open source is to the developer experience is just much better, right? Like you can just spin up in your machine and then start seeing your data very easily. So we focus a lot on how people can get started quickly. How can then this start seeing their data very quickly and um, and how can then they instrument like start sending their application data to us uh, very quickly right so those are from a like product roadmap perspective in, in terms of monetization what we have seen is that there are like companies which are like whenever company gets after a bigger size like after a certain size there's a certain set of features which companies would need mm -hmm. for example things like uh, request based access control, much finer control of like which people can see which dashboards, um, things like SAML configuration that if you have logged in through this provider, then you should be able to access, like you should have get certain number of permissions in the product, right? Uh, so those are the sort of things which we are seeing bigger companies start asking us already. And and the, the view, the, the sort of view we have taken there is that, hey, like, if you're a small team, you're running uh, um, like 40, 30 people team, 40 people team, you, you can just use the open source version free. Uh, like, uh, and you might not need such products. Only once you get bigger, you need uh, such features. And our view is that like, hey, if you like finding value through Signals, uh, like you should be able to uh, part with some part of that value, right? So that's, that's the view we have on sort of where we want to monetize and where we want to sort of let the community play and get feedback from there. Absolutely, absolutely. And would you, would you say this is uh, a, a challenge inherently in building a, uh, an open source uh, company? Basically, again, going back to the development cycles, the backlog, the roadmap, and where to prioritize. And uh, and in the end, how it might translate to actually making decisions about pricing, 
monetization, it's um, I'm sure it's a tricky water to navigate. Uh, what would you say? Yeah, so I think uh, it's an interesting uh, problem to solve uh, on like what pieces the community is interested in, like paying for while what things is like inherently should be in the community edition, right? So that's a debate which we constantly have. I think what what we have sort of found is that big companies are interested in having somebody who is whom you can go to occasionally and who is expert in that product. Uh, so, and if you're a small team, if you're just running it like a sort of an India operation, it's fine. But like, if you get to a like 500 people company, you need somebody to go to, right? Because it's it's like at least our product is a very critical part of your infrastructure. If it goes down, uh, it's not like a nice to have product. Like it's like critical to running your company successfully. So you don't don't want to just uh, run it where if like you where you don't know if something goes wrong, how how can you fix it and things like that, right? So so that's that's what I have seen and like that's uh, going a little bit. Of course, there's always a debate on like, hey, like can this be in open source and can this like can this be in the community edition or should this be in the enterprise edition, right? But I think as of now, we have sort of take it in on a call by call basis. Like, okay, okay, like what what does it make sense? Like, who is the persona? Is the persona which is like a small team would need this? Then we'll keep it in an open source community edition. But if it's something which is more relevant for bigger enterprises and they are probably deriving value more value from it, uh, then we probably put it in an enterprise edition, right? And so that's like one piece of it, but the other piece is also, as you said, right? Like, because it's an open source project, we have lots of different type of personas who are using the project and lots of different interests. And then, hey, like I'm using in this way, like I'm in, using in a home lab environment and I need this particular sort of support. Or, hey, I am using in this old version of Linux and this doesn't work, right? So, so I don't know. Like one good thing is there is that because it's an open source project, we ask them to like uh, can you create a community uh, like issue and then order a discussion, and then we sort of understand like if there is many people in the community who are interested in this, right? And based on that, that sort of informs our prioritization decision. But, but yeah, like the amount of requests we get, the amount of sort of type of users which we get is much. Uh, larger compared to if you are just a uh, um, closed source company, right? Because you work with like a small set of customers who are paying you, and probably you have chosen them carefully, or they have chosen you carefully. Uh, but 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 we love this this mode of engagement because this helps us get uh, insights from the real world much faster, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we we start getting feedback from users much faster that hey. For example, recently somebody opened an uh, issue in our community that, hey, there's a project called Backstage, which is becoming very important. Can Signal support that? Sorry? Spotify's Backstage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, or somebody mentioned Signal in that community, right? And and maybe if we are like a closed source company, people would not have cared. Like, uh, but now because there's a huge plethora of people who are using it, actively seeing the code base, they are suggesting to that community. So, uh, like we come into attention of their community also. And then we also know that, okay, like there's something called backstage, which is getting like, more popularity and maybe we should pay attention to that. So, so that's pretty amazing, right? Uh, in terms of like getting feedback from the real world much quicker rather than just being based on like our product management team or like our product team. So it's sort of like whole, uh, our community is acting as a semi product development team, right? For us, because they are sort of always thinking that okay, can can signals be used here, or it would have been good if signals has integration with backstage. Uh, so that helps. Uh, but of course, like there's a lot of like much larger uh, slats of issues to sort of filter through. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so it's like <laughs> a trade-off between like it's, it's like different model. It's like different way of building product, right? So yes. I, Involving everybody in the decision, everybody has a say, they can mention your product while compared to like, okay, there are like five people who think are the best or who th we think are, know the best about what should be in the product and uh, they should build it. And this sort of way is like much faster. 
as in you can just decide, okay, this, 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 and let's build it. While this is sort of taking more people in the committee, but like we are of the belief that this is like a more longer term path to success. Like if you want to really make a product which is changes the landscape, you need to involve everybody and then take take everybody along with you, get feedback from the community, keep getting feedback from the community and build what people are looking for rather than uh, like have like think what's best for the world and then build it. So it's like two views and choosing open source, we have sort of by default taken this view and as of now we are loving it. I love it myself. And, and thanks for, for sharing this. I think this is important advice. Uh, just to ask for an extra minute or two about uh, the monetization aspect. I think a lot of people are in, in your similar situation where, you know, smaller teams, but also really big ones and big projects are using their software. So when, when that is happening, do you, you guys ask yourselves at all about uh, the, the pricing aspect of it because you know it could be could be a company license it could be something based on usage and say it like is that part of is that pricing conversation something that is happening like early on for you guys or do you push it back uh, is there some advice here for other founders in this exact situation um, yeah i think we have sort of not crystallized the pricing i think we are still sort of figuring it out but i think what is helpful here to provide different options to the customers or like uh, interested leads who are like saying, okay, I'm interested in say enterprise edition. Uh, what are the pricing options you have, right? And rather than us just saying, okay, we do seed based pricing or we do users based pricing, we sort of go to them and like try to understand like what makes sense for them. Okay. And, and this is like our, our current state as in we have not sort of crystallized like what would be our eventual pricing model. Uh, and sometimes they are like very good advice, we, which we have not sort of thought of, uh, because ultimately you have to qualify like what value you are providing and sort of try to charge a percent of that value, right? And and that's like broadly what the pricing philosophy is. That and a good thing here is that. So people don't say that, hey, like give everything else for free, like because people know that, okay, this is a project, there's a company behind it. And so people understand that, right? But what makes sense for them as a company? Like for example, do they have, do they want more predictability in the pricing versus like, do they want to only pay for what they use? Do they want um, pricing based on, like have flexibility on how many people they want to add? Like, is that the flexibility lever which they want compared to like, okay, I I I know like there will be only a few people who would be using a product or I have more control on that, but I really need flexibility on like how much data I want to post because that's the use case I have. And I don't know what sort of is the traffic which will be gonna come, right? So that sort of uh, conversations helps us understand from like, uh, the customer's perspective also that, okay, uh, like what are the challenges they are trying to solve, right? Because ultimately we are in a business to help solve customer's problem. Like product is a part of it and like providing that product at a reasonable pricing, which makes sense for us and for the team, right? And sometimes it's just just not the like number as in, but it's also like what are the accesses which you are trying to uh, leverage or so, so I think one one thing would be, one maybe suggestion would be that try to be more open with your customers in terms of what you are thinking of and what would make sense for them. And at least in our domain, because all customers are very mature, like VP and director engineering. So they, they have good suggestions. It's not that they don't know about pricing, but they have their concerns that, okay, if you charge me based on this, I don't have predictability of my pricing. Or if you charge me based on this, how will I add more people if my uh, if my uh, uh, like headcount increases? So if your persona or like people who are making buying decisions are like mature people or like as in like higher up in the org ladder, maybe if you talk to this to a developer, maybe they are not the uh, they may not have more context on like pricing. So it's also maybe depends upon like our context in terms of who our customers are, like who make the purchasing decision. But I think that, that has been helpful for us. 
Th th thank you for sharing this. I think this is very important. And, and it sounds like it's an ongoing process to, to qualify where the value is and, and price over that and have those conversations. Uh, thanks thanks for, for touching uh, on this. And uh, um, you have you have gone about growing the team over the past year with a growing interest. Is there a note we could uh, add about this? Um, are you oh, okay. hiring? Uh, has the headcount of your organization increased? It's just, yeah. Sure. So we are currently, I think, nine full-time employees and couple couple of contractors who work with us. Um, I think the broad philosophy we have here is to keep the team as small as possible and empower the team as much as possible. So we hire the best talent in terms of uh, who are interested in our domain, are excited by what product they want to work for, like in our authority space. And uh, we don't want to hire too much because, like, we're still, I think, we're still uh, in early stage. And then, in early stages, the way innovation happens is through tight collaboration and like being very responsive to the community needs. And if you're like big org, then sort of the insights gets lost in translation, right? For example, we have one product owner for each main vertical of the product, and they have sort of full uh, ownership on like what should be prioritized for that part of the product, right? So I think uh, keeping the small team team small has been one of our main things and keeping that team empowered. So it's not that you decide like, me or my co-founder decides and then it gets built. It's it's the product owners, what do they think should be built? And from there that gets prioritized, right? So I think that has helped us keep the team lean and also move fast because like, as an early stage startup, you need to move fast also, right? And as if you have too many uh, people involved in making a decision that slows the whole process. Uh, but yeah, like that's that's me talking to you today. I don't know, like if we scale for as we scale further, <laughs> uh, does does this become a problem or like we have to figure out new hierarchies and like of course there's need for like bigger teams, but this is our status of now. I I like it. this approach sounds you know very very sensible and everything you've said so far actually. So in, in trying to extract just a little more you know piece of advice from you, is there uh, is there something you might have done differently looking back uh, and you know, uh, there's any additional yeah, advice? Sure. Yeah, would you change something in what you've done so far, or some lesson that you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. I think I think a couple of things which we learned, like after launching the project, has been like one is like the single user developer experience is like very important for an open source project. So for a product like ours, like which is used by teams. Uh, in our first, like first hacker news launch, like the first version which we launched to the world, we had the sort of a big setup, and then we used to it as a data store, which is a great data store, but it requires a big setup to get started. Like it requires certain amount of memory, certain amount of CPU RAM to get started, right? And and what we found was that that has that sort of led to friction in terms of people trying out the product, right? Um, because it was difficult to get started in a single machine or you'd need certain like 8 GB RAM and like many people would have 4 GB RAM so they can't install signals in their machine. And what, so we basically learned from that and shipped with a new data store. We use ClickHouse currently and that that is a much lower uh, memory footprint to get started. And then as you scale, you can sort of scale and then it scales well also, right? And at scale, it's the users memory is like it compares similar to Druid, but it's it has a sort of requirement characteristics where it can run in like a two GB machine or a three GB machine, right? What that helped us is to start getting adoption much faster. And why is that? It's because anybody who is trying your product, right? Like developers who are trying this, the natural aim is to like start with a small machine or a small laptop. And if they see value, they they spend more time in it, they configure it, and then maybe spin a cluster for it, right? Uh, so I think that part we missed in the earlier aspect. We thought that, hey, like, because the product is need, used by teams, they can obviously spin up a Kubernetes cluster. 
right? But that sort of introduces friction because you need to have people who have permissions to uh, spin up a cluster. Many people don't have, right? And you're sort of preventing them from even giving a preview of like getting the experience started. So I think this is uh, something, and this is maybe not relevant for DevTools, com like companies or projects which have like individual developers as personas because that they would obviously optimize for that. But for projects which are more relevant for teams, even though like your eventual users would be coming from bigger teams, even then you need to op uh, like spend on single developer experience. What's a single machine or single laptop experience for your product? And that's super critical. And, and I mean, maybe if you would have learned, known that much earlier, we would have sort of started with a different data store and would have saved us like three, four months of our time. That's 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 excellent advice. Thanks for uh, for sharing that. Makes sense. And uh, you know, I understand you guys want to define the landscape, as uh, as you said, and that's the the best way to to approach it. Uh, would you like to you know quickly give people a snippet, uh, you know, where to go uh, to start using signals uh, and how easy it is to get started today? <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, I think you can just go to GitHub.com slash signals s i z n o z slash s i g n o z or you can go to our website, signals.io. Um, if you go to our docs, it should be very easy to get started. Like you can start on a single laptop, as I'm as I mentioning just now, right? That you can start in a single machine laptop, just try it out, see how it looks. Um, and we have a very active Slack community. We have 2000 members in our Slack community today and growing pretty rapidly. So if you have any questions, just head out to our Slack community, signals.io slash Slack. So, and yeah, just ask us any questions. We are like our developers, our maintainers are quite active there. And we have lots of other people in the community who are trying to tinker with the product, find different type of use cases, which we are not aware of. And if you have any interesting use cases or feedback for us, please uh, share in the community, open a GitHub issue, share any discussions, yeah. Absolutely, thanks, thanks, thanks for saying this. Uh, is, there a, is there a next, uh milestone uh, you have said that you might like to tell people about um, what's coming up? I think I think this two milestone especially such is like, as I said earlier, like our goal is to make, provide great observatory tooling for everybody, like companies of all shapes and sizes and how that can come is to like spreading the word more and more rapidly and getting more people involved in the community, getting more people engaging with the project. So like one of the milestones should be like, how, when can we get 100 contributors? We are like currently around 90 contributors, 100 contributors, 200 contributors, right? So I think uh, like if people are engaging with your project uh, and so there's a funnel, right? There's the users and then they see something is wrong and then they start contributing back to the project. So. Maybe we want to reach 200 contributors uh, pretty soon and reach to like 15,000 GitHub stars. So the whole goal is how can we make signals useful for more and more people out there, uh, make them reach the product. And we believe we have a product which if the right people find it, they would find it interesting. Uh, so yeah, uh, like one step further in defining the landscape. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Thank you, thank you for... Uh... Thank you for sharing everything. And uh, you know, my press for time is super busy, so I'll try not to over overextend ourselves. But um, you know, this was phenomenal, and people can get started immediately. Join the Slack uh, community, and uh, you know, everyone everyone is uh, keeping their eyes on you. I think uh, Signals is a super interesting uh, project. Yeah, and thanks uh, a lot. yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank you for the opportunity to to talk. Yeah, about. and thanks a lot for like doing this. I see you have invited a lot of open source founders in your podcast. And I think it's very helpful. I think we as a community should spread more word about like how can people do open source and even like building companies around it, right? Because it's it's a good way to sort of engage more deeply with a project. And uh, uh, so how can you uh, build communities around it? And as people get more and more information about like, hey, how things are done and like how other people have done it, I think more people will get up. And maybe one day we'll have all the projects by default open source rather than like closed source. I think that's that's the long-term vision.
<laughs> I, I think that the community is definitely increasing in size and I think people will find this very helpful and, and look up to your yep. work. So thank you so much.